Well, firstly, I just want to say, um, like, from my perspective, how much of an inspiration you have been. Like, just, uh, you know, obviously we played together for many, many years. And now watching you thrive and, and the way that you're playing basketball, but the way that you're, you know, promoting women um, in sport, off the court, and pushing a lot of the social justice movements and things like that, you've been incredible. Back when I played with you, you were pretty private. You didn't really talk much. You didn't really sort of open up about yourself or anything, really. I mean, in private, you did. What, like, what's changed? What's happened? And how have you evolved and grown through this and to become the leader that you are today? Um, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is going to sound like a heavy answer, but it's true, but it's pretty heavy. It's like society has changed. <laughs> so what, you know, what that has brought has been... Um, you know, more eyeballs to women's basketball, um, more microphones, a bigger platform. So we actually have the ability to talk about some of the things that have been normal in our lives for so many years, you know, like the pay inequities and the lack of opportunity and how difficult it's been to grow the WNBA and things like that. This is no, I mean, you know, those stories from day one of coming to this league, we all do. Um, there was just no way to, to speak on it. But to your point, I, I was definitely more quiet. I was definitely more private. And I think more than anything, I think of our generation as there was just the way, the way I describe it, it was just like a vibe. I don't know that somebody told me not to complain. I don't know yeah. that somebody told me to be quiet about things. I just kind of understood that I needed to just be thankful for what I had, thankful yeah. for the opportunity at all. So I think yeah. for a really long time, that's what I was. I was just like, hey guys, we get to play. So we should just be thankful for it. And so we yeah. never complained about the things, um, maybe behind closed doors we did, but not not openly and in the public. Um, and then another part of my answer, of course, is um, meeting Megan, dating Megan, being around Megan, and just kind of seeing what it was to be an athlete who did speak up, up on these things. Yeah. Um, Cause to your point, I was complaining behind closed doors. I just never said it publicly. And then, I don't know, I kind of developed a little more confidence in that way. And the rest is history. Yeah, first of many ways that we will see WNBA plays, players using their voices all season long. But I think a big part of it was just, if we don't speak on these things, who will? Right, like how is anybody gonna know all the ways in which women in sport are being held back if the women in sport aren't the ones bringing attention to it? And again, I really think it has a lot to do with, um, you know, sometimes definitely in America, it, there's this like slogan, shut up and dribble that has been used. And I feel like people my age, we kind of joke about it. We're like, we were the shut up and dribble era. Like we literally just shut up and dribbled because yeah. we were just, again, happy to be there. And the way I think about it now is there was so much I could have said then. There's so much you could have said then. We didn't. And so now that I, I am this older athlete that has all this experience, that has seen so much, you can say the same thing. Like just by nature of our experience of being professional athlete for as long as we were, we just have like this intimate knowledge. And if we don't talk about it, how will anybody know? And so the way I look at it now is I just don't want to miss. I feel like there was a missed opportunity when we didn't talk, when I didn't talk as a younger athlete. And now I just don't want to miss those opportunities. I want to make yeah. sure I'm saying things so this younger generation can have it even better. How do you handle sort of the retribution or the people, the haters? You know, how do you handle the people that have always got something to say, even though it's not relevant or even useful? Yeah. Uh, uh. How do you handle that? Like what, um, do you just ignore it? Like the social media and stuff? Yeah, I, I'm, this is a work in progress. I'm sure like everyone, because it is, I mean, I'm a human being and I'm definitely a sensitive person. Like people, I don't think necessarily know this about me. Like I'm incredibly sensitive. And so when I do open up my Twitter and there's like, you know, jerks in it and people saying bad things, it does impact me. So I have to really be like mindful of my social media use. To be honest, a couple weeks ago, um, I decided like just to log out of Twitter. I was like, let me just log out. Like, let me just not, not look at all. And and that helped. I noticed like a total shift. I just didn't, I just didn't have those moments where I was like, oh man, another jerk talking bad. Um, and that really helped. But at the same time, you have to remember that just because there's a couple people on Twitter and it feels loud, it's literally a couple people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you can't let like five people who are in comments 
dictate or allow them to dictate how you're going to feel about yourself or how you're going to feel about what you're saying because at the core of it I know the things that I'm saying whatever topic we're talking about like I know it's coming from a place of knowledge and experience and I know what I'm speaking on is is facts it's factual so it's like they can't take that away from me but yeah I mean honestly thank god there wasn't social media when we were younger <laughs> I don't even know if I would have been able to handle it yeah it's yeah so I know it's it is hard yeah and it's something that the young athletes now you know i mean they've grown up with it whereas for us it's yeah you know, it's new something very different <laughs> um so i guess maybe we'll just move on over to basketball a little bit obviously a lot of people talk about your age yada 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 like who cares <laughs> but for me what the most amazing thing has been is just the transformation of your body like as mm-hmm. your teammate uh, you always used to look after yourself anyway compared to what i did um <laughs> <laughs> um, but like in the last sort of 10 years your body is really it's you cut you define your tone you look after yourself you really um it's it's incredible to see and obviously it's paying off on the court but what like what sort of changed in that respect like how did you um and what made you make that change um to your workout regime yeah um so basically two things kind of happened happened simultaneously between like 2012 and 2014 I had hip a hip surgery so one on each hip and a major knee surgery that cost me a WNBA season. And the season I came back after that it really hit me. It was like three surgeries in the span of a year and a half is never easy. But, you know, I was always like a young player. So at 24, 25, that probably would have been a breeze, maybe even at 30. But at 33, 34, it was like, oh, this has actually taken a toll on my body that I was not prepared for. And I felt, so this is the second thing that was happening kind of simultaneously. And who knows, one probably impacted the other, but I also felt like physically I was plateauing and then my game was plateauing. Like, whoa, I hit a major plateau. And that was when I kind of had that look in the mirror where I was like, all right, this is not, I could sense it, it playing more years wasn't going to help me. Like nothing was going to get me over this hump. Nothing yeah. was going to turn my career around. Like something was negatively happening to my, to the physical part of things. So I hired a coach, her name's Susan. She's really more of like a performance coach than anything else. Cause it's like, all of the above. It's not just strength training. It's not just conditioning. It's diet. It's nutrition. It's, you know, she talks to me about sleep and meditation and all the things. So hiring her is really what did it all. And she was working with the storm at the time. And I basically, she had been bugging me a little bit about like, Oh, try this recipe or Hey, make sure you drink this protein shake. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the end of the season where again, I just felt like I was plateauing. I basically said like, I was like, all right, Susan, like, this is it. Here are the keys. This is it. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And it's the best decision I ever made. And that was in 2000, like 14 or 15. So we're going on seven, eight years of it. And I mean, the proof's in the pudding. You haven't looked back. No, definitely not. I wish, I mean, so just to like give a little, put a little sprinkle on this story. Stewie, when Stewie was 20, it was like after her second year, Stewie actually asked me like, so like, what's the one thing if you were my age, you wish you could go back and change? And I was like, I would hire Susan. So I guess on that, um, what does a day in the life of Subo look like in terms of, so off the court and on the court, what does it look like? Like in terms of your training, is it a lot more? Is it just more consistency? What is it? It's just smarter. I feel like a lot of times that people think if like the workout wasn't impossible, was it worth it? Like, no, like that's not, that's not my mentality at all. My mentality is, do everything I can. So when the game comes around, I'm ready for it. I'm in like peak condition. So every day is basically about fueling for a workout and then refueling, you know, and then making sure I get rest for the next day. Every off season is about, you know, not overdoing it, but doing just what I need to do to make sure I'm in peak Condition. This is one of the reasons she is the best point guard in the world. She can make plays like that. I've always said to you a few times, like the culture in basketball is really different, like in Australia compared to America. And a, and a part of that from from where I sit is just the professionalism. Um, the way that uh, the WNBA and the athletes sort of work together to make sure that the league is thriving. 
What do you see, if anything, like the differences between the two basketball cultures? Because you've seen a lot of Australian basketball culture through me and the other Aussies that have been over there. I do. I definitely think that like where you grow up and what culture you're exposed to like help shape who you are as a person and a player and I feel like all the Aussie players that I've played with there is like a shared you guys have like a shared kind of background there's definitely like a mindset you all have like very tough-minded like very tough-minded and I don't even mean like your physical play yeah when you play against the national team it's always physical but like just like there's like a mental toughness that I feel like every Aussie I've ever been around like possesses in some way. That's sort of <laughs> how I sort of see you as well though. Like I think when we, um, just because I, I know you like as a teammate and as a friend and mm -hmm. everything, like I've always seen that in you as well. So um, it might just be a shared basketball thing that, well yeah. to get to a certain level, you know, you have to be, um, there has to be something inside you that drives you, you know. Yeah, I always thought for a long time, I always thought it was like something to do with like the Institute and, and the fact that you guys go when you're so young because it kind of like forces you to grow up in these ways that just like naturally leads to a mental toughness because you kind of had to like figure it out at, you know, how old were you? Like 14 or 15, oh, right? 15, yeah, I was 15. Yeah, yeah. right. So I always, I always wondered if that like played a little bit of a role because I could only imagine, I remember talking to you about the Institute, and like your experience and stuff. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, I can only imagine what, like what impact that has when you're 15 and you kind of like go somewhere that's away yeah. from like your family and blah, blah, blah. And like what that kind of instills in you. I mean, both negative and positive, I would assume. Yeah. No, I think this, it's now called the COE, the Center of Excellence, okay. but they're still doing that. So instead of going to college, obviously they handpick the best kids from around Australia and they go into um, kind of like a dormitory living scenario and train and mm -hmm. everything. You know, back then, and especially that crop that came through who went over to the WNBA and the girls that you know, so Penny, Susie, myself, mm -hmm. um, Sally, Billy, um, we were playing against women, you know, in the yeah. professional league when we were 15. And I think that, in, in my opinion, I, I truly believe that that's something that gave us a little bit of an edge because we had to compete against grown women from yeah. such an early age. And women seem to mature a little bit differently to men um, where it's a little bit earlier. So like we can physically compete at that level. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know whether it was the toughness that that brought out or whatever, but we did have a pretty special group of girls, that particular group. In America, that professionalism and whether it's because you all go into college and the NCAA. Yeah, or... I, I think, I actually think college is, is, does, is like a factor because in a lot of ways, I don't love this about American sports, but um, because I think it does like hinder the professional league a little bit, but women's college basketball is huge over here. It is. It's huge. It's yeah. massive. It's the big, I mean, we all played it. I love it. It's, I don't mean to, I'm not putting it down at all. I love it. It's a big part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is similar, kind of similar to what I was getting out with you guys in the Institute at, you know, for me, it was 17, 18 for college kids. You're, you're in college, give or take 18 to 21 or something like that. And you're exposed to a lot, a lot of mm -hmm. pressures, a lot of media attention, a lot of like high stakes moments. So if you're like a, an elite player, you're gonna get a taste of that at age 18. And I think yeah. it does force you to, to like develop a backbone. It does force you to grow up in these ways, um, like as an athlete that you, you, you take with you. You take with you when you go to the WNBA. With a look slider. Um, I think we'll move over to the coaches. So of all the coaches that you've had, so you've had some pretty amazing ones. You, you know, mm -hmm. obviously you know you've got a great relationship with him, but you've had Lynn Dunn. And Donovan, Brian Agler, Klopp. Krop, yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> Klopp's back in it. Yeah, he is. Klopp just got it. Yeah. Good on him. He's been around yeah. for many, many years, but that's great. Um, what, like in your mind, if you had to rate the top five best qualities in a coach, <laughs> what would they be? Because I think that we come from a time when we were used to coaches being a lot tougher and a lot mm -hmm. harder on the athletes. And I don't yeah. think now... The athletes like that as much. Yeah, or I don't think so either. <laughs> yeah, it's different. But I want to know what you think and what you think constitutes a great coach. Yeah, um, I think first and foremost, a coach who has an identity is super important. 
And it's not to say that every single coach I've played for, I agreed with yeah. their identity, but I've been really lucky in that I can say pretty much every coach I've played for had one. Yeah. And I think that is so important because let's use Brian as an example. It's just, we both played for him. It's an easy example because he, everybody knows Brian's identity. When you watch a team that Brian Agra coaches, what are you going to get? This a crazy defensive minded team that's going to play so super hard. And like, you can, you can hang your hat on that every game. Cause that's who Brian was. That's who Brian was every day when he walked into practice, you know? Yeah. So it's just like an easy example, but I could, I could go down the line on all the coaches and pick out a point. But the point is if a coach doesn't have that, I feel like teams can always sense it. So it's yeah. not even that the coach has to be right. It's not about being right or wrong. It's not about, is this the best style or is that the best style? Every coach is going to have their own style. It's those that really sell out to it and like really buy into who they are and the identity that they want their team to have. I feel like that's first and foremost. Like if I were to ever coach a team, I would really make sure that that was like crystal clear that everybody yeah. knew exactly like who I was, what I stood for and where I was coming from. And I never wavered on that. And I think you can get through hard times, right? Like there's going to be hard times in every season that's, it's unavoidable. And I feel like when you have a coach that's kind of like centered in that way and grounded in that way, it really, it allows the team to just exhale a little bit because they know that that person's going to show up no matter what. So I feel like that is like the most important quality for a coach. You have to be able to adapt, like being adaptable um, is really important. I think um, this can be number three, but it's kind of like a segue from two to three. Something that coaches that coaches that I've played for have done that I hate and I've always said, I'm like, I swear I'll never do this if I ever coach. You have to make decisions that are best for the team, not what makes you feel good. Yeah, right. So, you know, example could be like, you just played your last three games and you were meant to have a day off, but you lost the last game. And so now all of a sudden you're like, nope, guys, no day off. Yeah. Who's that, who's that decision for? Is that decision because you really think these players need to come into the gym because they're going to solve the problems in one day? Yeah. Or is that, is that as a coach to make yourself feel better so you can go to sleep at night thinking, well, I did everything I could. And yeah. I think some coaches fall into that trap. They think, mm -hmm in doing everything that they could, they're helping their team. In reality, that was just for themselves. That was just so they could feel good about it. So I feel like as a coach, you always want to make sure you're making decisions for your team, not what makes you feel good. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Now, those those two things can coexist. It's like not, it's not always so black and white, but that's definitely something that through the years, I just, I've, I've never liked it when it felt like coaches were doing things for themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think like being a great communicator is, is really important. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's having a conversation with a player, you know, like a private conversation with a player where you're talking about things, being able to be a good communicator there, or you're talking to the team and you're trying to explain like what you want from them. I think it's really important to, to have communication skills. And then number five, I don't know, I, I guess maybe like, maybe have a really good balance between work and fun yeah. like it can't all be work it obviously can't all be fun but you need those like moments of levity to like get you through a season right like yeah. WNBA season's a grind and there's going to be highs and lows and so you need someone who at times can like bring in just like a calming moment where you like laugh a little bit or have fun yeah yeah that's just off the top I'm sure there's others <laughs> good do you think you'll ever coach or? I don't think so, no. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think you've said that to me before because I think I've asked that to you. I've asked you that before and you, you said no. But I think your brain, like your basketball brain, is so much more advanced than anybody else's that I know. So <laughs> if you were to be a coach, I think you'd be pretty iffy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know what it is? It's actually more so the life of a coach that I don't want. Yeah. Like X's yeah. and O's, cool. Like, yeah, let's go out there and drop some plays, like whatever. But yeah. just, I feel like I just lived the life. Yeah, I can, so. I tell you, I totally relate. Um, you know, when I retired, it was like, no, I don't, that's the one thing I don't want to do anymore. I don't want to be traveling. I don't want, right. you know, to be watching film, cutting up video. <laughs> it's dealing yeah, with. I'm good. No, I, 
you know, in your mind, what are some of the greatest challenges that the WNBA is facing right now? Obviously, it's a prosperous time at the moment, but, you know, is there um, anything in particular that you think that um, the WNBA is battling? Yeah, I mean, it's really all the same challenges. Um, we are, I feel like there is a, a corner that's being turned and it does, we can all feel that momentum and, and you know, we also see it. We see it in some of the, the new sponsorships that we've gotten, some of the new support we've gotten for our league. Like you hear rumors all the time of new ownership groups wanting to get involved. We never heard that before. So yeah. in a lot of ways, like things are trending in the right way, but at the same time, um, the same, very similar challenges exist. You know, just getting people to, um, I guess, move away from having us be the butt of the joke. We've been the butt of the joke for a really long time. Ha ha ha, we get it. But now, you know, society, like I said earlier, society has changed in a lot of ways where, you know, you can't be sexist and you can't be homophobic and you can't be racist. And that's a lot of the issues that directly impact our country, but directly impact our league because it's the makeup of our league. So it's been really great to see that change. But again, it doesn't happen overnight. Like these things are still issues and they're still impacting our league. But I hope it continues to, to kind of trend the way it is now. Yeah. So um, lastly, uh, is this, what do you think? Are you going to play World Cup this year? No. If you do, I'm you, like, you, you might be there. I'll come watch you. <laughs> not funny. <laughs> no, I'm not playing either. Okay, cool. Let's go hang out. I'll come hang out. Yeah. Down the road. I told you, I'll definitely, I mean, <laughs> assuming Megan plays in her World Cup, which is next year, or like, yeah, 2023. I'll definitely come visit you then. You can come to some games, I'll hang out. That'd be fun. No, I would <laughs> love that. Um, yeah, back in, uh, back to our friendship roots, that would be lovely. All right, well, look, I love you and thank you so much for being my first um, interview. Anytime. I my pleasure. Was- no, yeah. you did great. You did great. Oh, mate, thank you. God, you're a good girl. Um, all right, doll. I'll text you, but love you, fun, and yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, doll.